say, this is my Bible. I am what it says that I am. I can do what it says I can do. <laughs> I'm a believer, not a doubter. I'm a doer, not just a hearer of God's word. My life is the better. After having heard the word of faith, my faith comes by hearing and hearing by the precious word of God. If you believe that, give God a praise. Hallelujah. Some of you, you know, you're very observant. You saw I turned my tablet over. One of the reasons is because is it's too distracting for me. It's hard for me to do what I'm going to do, looking at the pictures and looking at trying to see who, who all is, 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 is coming on. So I'll leave that to my wife. She can do all that. I, I just want to preach God's word. I want you to turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. What we've been talking about and what we're going to continue to talk about for a while is living and walking in the spirit, living and walking in the spirit. Now, you know what my narrative is. October 2019, God told me to teach faith with a passion that the people would get it. I did not know that COVID-19 was just over the horizon. Then he told me to also teach uh, the people then how to pray and couple their faith with their prayers because then he wanted to set us up for an unleashing of his power in our midst like never before. Then he wanted me to teach unity, which is basically where we are now, to teach unity because he said, my people are not quite there yet. Then he said, then once you get into the corporate prayer agenda and, and, and uh, 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 notes that I've given you, then you'll see that move of God like never before. Well, that's what we're into now. I'm excited about what God is doing in this ministry. I'm excited about the vision that God has given us for this ministry. And we give God all the praise, all the honor and all the glory for what has been unleashed in this ministry, what is being unleashed in this ministry and what's about to be unleashed in this ministry as, as it pertains to the power of God and the manifestation of God's presence in this place on a continual basis, on a continual basis. My objective and my job here now is to get you to a point where you understand the vision, you have the vision, you understand the vision and will not allow anything to deter you from being a part of that vision. It's very critical because the enemy will, enemy will come against you now and try to derail your purpose and your mandate to be a part of what God, this great thing that God is doing. So you have to guard your mind. You got, got to guard what you see. You have to guard what you say, and you got to regard what you hear in order for God then to magnify his presence in your life and in your family, and of course, in this church. So now, living and walking in the spirit will allow you to live a life more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So my objective is to bring you into a closer fellowship and relationship with God, uh, encouraging you to walk in the fullness of God's plan for your life in Christ. Now remember this, this is a universal axiom of truth. We are all fashioned by God as spiritual beings to function in concert with spiritual principles. We must endeavor to live and walk in the light of who we are. We are spirit. We possess a soul that makes up our mind, will, emotions, intellect, and memory, and all that is housed in this fleshly temple we call a body. So now, for, for the purpose of definition, what do you mean, Pastor, when you say living in the spirit? I'm gonna do, I broke it down for you, and I want you to listen to the definitions. If you have not or do not have them, write them down. Hallelujah. We define living in the spirit this way. It's fellowship and enhancing your relationship with God through Jesus Christ by your communion with the Holy Spirit on a consistent basis. Well, Pastor, that sounds good, but what about walking in the Spirit? Are they the same? Somewhat, they couple, they're coupled together. Walking in the Spirit is the process of meditation, obedience, discipline, and the discipline it takes to practice His presence on a daily basis. To live and walk 
in the spirit requires more effort now because of the fall of man and the redemption process required to reestablish what was lost in the Garden of Eden by Adam's plural decision to disobey the command of God. So now we are left with having to get back to where God had called us to be. Jesus Christ came, gave his life, rose again the third day and purchased that for us. Hallelujah. So now it is our, it is our choice if we make it to get to a point where we can start to walk in the spirit. And the Bible tells us that if we walk in the spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Put Galatians chapter five, verse 16 up. This is where we're at. This is what I want, want you to see. This is what I'm pounding in you, in, into your hearts by the revelation of God. It says, but I say walk habitually in the Holy Spirit. Seek him and be responsive to his guidance. How do I walk habitually? in the Holy Spirit. You walk habitually in the Holy Spirit by, a de, a di, by, excuse me, by developing your prayer life and by obedience to God's word. Those are, par that's, that's critical. I walk habitually in the Holy Spirit by a consistent prayer life and by my praise God and by, <laughs> oh boy my obedience to God's word. Seek him and be responsive to his guidance. So now if I'm seeking him and I'm responsive to his guidance, I can only be that way, walking in the spirit and obeying the Lord. And then you will certainly not carry out the desires of the sinful nature, which responds impulsively without regard for God or his precepts. Amen. So that's our foundational verse. Now I want you to, to go to Ephesians chapter three, verse 16. We're going to read Ephesians chapter three, verse 16 through, I believe, 20. I didn't do this on Sunday. I'm going to do a little bit of it today. Hallelujah. It says Ephesians chapter six, or excuse me, chapter three, verse 16. It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, verse 17, that you being rooted and grounded in love, verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Amen, hallelujah. And so now, there is, while I'm, when, when, I, when I decide to live in the spirit, or walk in the spirit, and not fulfill the lust of the flesh, when I, when I take, make a choice for living and walking in the spirit, it accelerates God's plan for my life and helps me to develop what I call a more spirit sensitive life. That's right. I become more sensitive to the Holy Spirit as I walk and live in him. Amen. And he walks and lives in me. So here are some advantages to living and walking in the spirit. Number one, it helps to develop. And these come from Ephesians chapter three, verse 16 through 20. Number one, it helps to develop or excuse me, it helps to spiritually develop uh, the plan of God for my life. It helps to spiritually develop the plan of God for my life. While I'm communing with God, God communes with me and he shares with me the plan that he has for my life and gives me the revelation necessary to carry it out. We walk by faith, not by sight. Number two, it is, uh, it is the key to avoiding mistakes and mishaps that when I'm walking in the spirit, I'm apt not to make a whole lot of mistakes because I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. And how many of us have made mistakes uh, and had mishaps and then wish that we had listened to that inner man or our conscience when it told us or, or, or he told us or she told us not to do it 
or we had this check that's in our, in our spirit that said, don't do it. How many of us <laughs> wish we can go back and take back some of those things that we impulsively did that we paid the price for later? Hallelujah. Now, another thing about or advantage about living and walking in the spirit is that it powers up my witness through lifestyle evangelism. People ought to, ought to see God in you. They ought to see God in you. In this day and age, where there's so much going on, and God says you are the light of the world, the salt of the earth, if that's what he says, that's what you be. Because when God says something, it's already established. You got it? And I've said this over and over again. When God created birds, he didn't give them flying lessons. He just told them to fly. They started flying without flying lessons. When, he's, when he said fish swim, fish swam. They didn't have to take swimming lessons. They swam. Well, when God says you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world, then that's what you be. You are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. And when I walk in the spirit and live in the spirit, then my, my example will influence other people to want to know what is it that they have because, excuse me, because I want it. Amen. And then another advantage of walking and living in the spirit is, is that it's the key to developing the character of God in me. Look, skill, talent, and ability, I can develop without much help. But to develop my character, I need to be with somebody. You can say you're patient all day long, but now if you're on a, if you're on an island and the monkey comes out the tree and you don't, you're the monkey, only one's there, and he keeps messing with your bananas, you're gonna lose your patience. So in order to develop character, I need to be with somebody. I need contemporary or historical examples to help me to develop my character. Holiness should be a part of my character development because holiness is a lifestyle that's totally committed to the word of God. Integrity should be a part of my character. Integrity is my right now commitment to doing, to doing the right things. Hallelujah. And so holiness and integrity are part of those things that I need to develop. And you know what? I need somebody to help me to do that. When, when, when I started the ministry, uh, at that time, pastors were being thrown out of their church here in this city. And so I, uh, I, I realized real early that, you know what, there are some things I needed that, 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 that I needed to help me to do what God had called me to do. One of them was I needed to develop some integrity. Okay. I thought I had it until I met uh, Apostle Frederick K.C. Price. And so now I went on a, I, 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 he, he became my mentor. I became his mentee and he taught me integrity. He taught me in integrity. And it, was a, it, it wasn't an easy lesson. Being taught integrity is not an easy lesson because it's a continual examination of self. Okay? And so now, over, over the years, I've developed that integrity. Hallelujah. So, so I needed that from, from, from Dad Price, got it from Dad Price. And that's why I say skill, talent, and ability, you can develop by yourself. But to develop your character, you got to be with somebody. Another advantage of living and walking in the spirit is that it is the key to your giving to establish the kingdom. It's the key to your giving to establish the kingdom. As you walk in the spirit, hallelujah, and not fulfill the lust of the flesh, you'll find out that God will minister, you, minister to you along lines and challenge you in your giving. That's right. Now remember, I said it earlier. I give because of my love for him. Number two, I give because he expects me to give. Number three, I give because it rids me of my lack. Number four, I give because it cements the fact that I am loyal to him. Where my treasure is, my heart will be also, okay? 
And so and I added another one, another one to this. When I, when, when, when I walk by faith, not by sight, when I am living and walking in the spirit of God, it will stop me from complaining when it's time to give. It will stop me from complaining when it's time to give. All they want is your money. No, we don't work like that. There's a time to give. There's a time for the word. Once we get through at the time from get for giving, we go to the word. That, that ain't what it's all about. So I got to got, got, I got to get to the point where I'm not challenged every time I give in the negative. All they want which is your money. Here we go again. The preacher talking about money. No, we're talking about not so much getting anything from you, but we're trying to get something back to you. We want God to bless you. We want God to do something in your life. We want you to fulfill the, uh, your uh, goals in your life. We want you to succeed in the things that you mapped out for your life with the help of the Holy Spirit. We want to see you on top going higher, the head not the tail, the uh, uh, above and not beneath, prospering in every good thing. And God has a financial plan that will help you to do that. And so we introduce the plan to you. We don't pressure you. We, we just introduce it to you. What you do is your business. But the last thing you do or should be doing is if you're walking and living in the spirit of God, the last thing you ought to be doing is complaining when it comes time to give. Just chill out and let God minister to you. Here they go again. Here go another offer. You know, the problem is <laughs> because for some, you no, know, the problem is uh, you feel pressure because you ain't got it. Well, if you ain't got it, we ain't talking to you. <laughs> Amen. Uh, uh, you should be, but you should be in faith for us to get it. But if you ain't got it, we're not talking to you. Praise God. You know what? Pray for us. Pray with us. Agree with us that every need is met. And it will be, praise the Lord, no matter. And so now I have to understand that there are some advantages to living and walking in the spirit. Hallelujah. When I live and walk in the spirit, I hear God's voice more clearly. And that's a critical point because, like I've said a couple of times before, we are spirit beings having an earthly experience. We have a soul that makes up our mind with emotions, 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 emotions. It's like it's like a broken record, ain't it? Emotions, emotions, intellect and memory. OK, the one part of us where the enemy attacks the most is our emotional state. That's it. We have people that have more emotional scars than anything else in their, their lives. That's right. And see, one of the things that brought all that out it was COVID lockdown because people are not, you know, how I want to say this. You know, a lot of people, they, they have issues. Let me give you an example. I, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, a, I was riding with my son and then I said, do you, you know, but, you know, do you, have you noticed this? You know, then I remembered he's in L.A. and uh, they all, a lot of them drive crazy out there. But uh, he, uh, you know, here in Saginaw, you know, I noticed that people drive more recklessly. They're more impatient. They're more uh, tuned up to anger. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll blow you down real quick. And it used to didn't be like that. Uh, they, you know, I've seen arguments. I've seen people getting out of their cars. That's, that's, that's not, for, for this area, that's not normal when everybody can be anywhere you want to be in 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, half hour at the most. See, but part of that is because of the fact that the enemy has been messing with their emotional state. And when you can get into your emotional state, he can do things with your emotions and, and, and pull you away from God and you will feed that emotional deficit every day of your life subconsciously, not knowing that you're raising a monster 
that's angry all the time and be, it will be dismissed from the glory of God and what he wants to do in your life. And you can't let that happen. Last but not least, living and walking in the spirit accelerates the fact that then I become more innovative and creative. I become more innovative and creative. You, there's a lot of God-given ideas out there and th or things that God has given you that you've done nothing about. And then you see somebody else do it and you'll say something like, well, you know what? I had that same idea. Well, you're walking and living in, in, in the spirit. God will give you these ideas for increase, things that will benefit the body of Christ, benefit the world. Unleash them in you, but if you don't do anything about it, you will have to give that idea to somebody else who is bold enough to walk by faith, not by sight, and see that thing operate in their lives. God is good. Last but not least, when it comes to walking in the spirit and uh, living and walking in the spirit, when you do that, you can withstand persecution and satanic attacks convincingly. You can get through them convincingly. See, you can only be persecuted by those you need acceptance from. If you don't need acceptance from, from them, it doesn't bother you about what they say. Got it? I need acceptance from God. I need acceptance from my wife and my family. But I don't really need acceptance from anybody else. If I obey God and do what God tells me to do, all my other relationships will get the overflow of my predictable relationship with God. And you know what? That's that's solid for me. Hallelujah. So 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 see, although they may talk about you, it doesn't matter unless you need acceptance from them. And when you walk in the spirit, when you walk in the spirit, I'm going to say it again. When you walk and live in the spirit, God covers you. He covers you when persecution comes. Now, he doesn't take the persecution away. You're going to go through some persecution, but now he'll see you through it to the other side. Hallelujah. And you'll be the more for it. Never take a brick and throw it at the person that's throwing the bricks at you. Take the brick and build a bridge. Sooner or later, those that persecute you will cross that bridge to get to you to ask for forgiveness. Amen. So now, Why is it so difficult for people to live and walk in the spirit, living the spirit sensitive life? Why is it so difficult? Now, we've heard from Galatians chapter five, verse 16, Galatians chapter five, verse 16 uh, tells us if we live in the uh, walk in the spirit, we will, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why is it so hard for us to do the right thing? Why is it? Huh? That's, that's a very good question. Why is it so hard for us to do the right thing? Hmm. Very good question. See, when I choose not to walk in the spirit, if I make that choice not to walk in the spirit, I'll, I allow satanic derailment to be a reality that starts off my spiritual growth. See, to grow in the things of God, to grow in the things of God, I must be walking and living in the spirit. That's the only way I can grow. Because it's like walking with your mentor. And he's pouring all that knowledge into you. It's like me going to a conference with my bishop, Bishop Ivy Hilliard, or when Dad Price was with us and sitting there and sucking up everything he tells me because he is the mentor, I'm the mentee. Got it? And so now, that same thing holds true when I walk and live in the spirit. I'm walking 
in the spirit. The Holy Spirit is teaching me all things, bringing all things to my remembrance. And you know what? I'm walking and going to another level. The one thing Adam realized when he fell in the garden was that that connection with God had been severed. Where God would come down and walk with him in the cool of the day in the garden on a daily basis, literally, and talk to him one on one. And he chose to do something that severed that relationship. Hmm. Thank God he got back reasonably well, but praise the Lord. So you can find it difficult to live and walk in the spirit because of your commitment to religion. Uh oh. See, when I say commitment to religion, I'm not talking about a church. I'm talking about a ceremonial observation, a personal set or institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, and practices. Okay, people, some people go to church because they're religious. My, my, my great great grandmama went, my great great grandmama went, my great grandmama went, my mama went, and I go. And so now they religiously go, but they never, they are, have never been taught how to walk in the spirit of God. They've never been really taught about holiness. To them, going to church is like going to a club. You go to see who got who with who and how they're dressed and it's a religious thing that you practice. And you know what? You shout, you have a good, good time and then once you get out, somebody asks you, well, what did they talk about? You never know. Well, it was good. See, we got to get out of this, this commitment to religion, not a church. Religion is a practice and attitude that we have about being in church. Got it? Number two, we find it difficult to live and walk by the spirit. 13 minutes. We find it difficult to live and walk in the spirit because of our commitment to relationships. In other words, what are you saying, pastor? God doesn't have first place in your life. You know, you came to church every Sunday until you met that guy. <laughs> yeah, you came every Sunday until you met that woman. Now you're starting to miss. So now, that person has taken over the place that God had once occupied. So our commitment to relationships can cause us to have difficulty living and walking in the spirit of God. Hallelujah. Number three, our commitment to routines. In other words, God is not on my agenda. Yeah, I believe him, but he's not on my agenda. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15, in the Amplified, Deuteronomy chapter 30, Verse 15. Now, why he gets that for me, because I'm going to read it from the from the screen. Uh, sometimes we are say Jesus is Lord, <laughs> but he's not. In other words, I choose to make my job my Lord. I choose to make my career my Lord. I choose to make my my uh, exercise routine my Lord. I choose to make a vacationing attitude every weekend, my Lord. Whatever I choose to make my Lord, it always, if it's not God, you're pushing him off the throne in your life. You're pushing him off the throne in your life. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15, it says, listen closely. I want you to listen closely now. I have set before you today life and prosperity or good and death and adversity or evil. Next verse. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God. See, they're talking about walking in the spirit. To walk, that is, to live 
each and every day in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judges, judgments or precepts so that you will live and multiply and that the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you are entering to possess. Now, now think about it. I told you one, the way to walk in the spirit and live in the spirit of God was that you had to obey the word. And that's what, there it is there, verse 17. But if, you, if your heart turns away, see, if, you, if, if in your routine, God has no place. He's not, at the, he's not on the throne in your life. Now, we like to say that he is. But man, anything can pull us away from the example that we should set that he is. But if your heart turns away and you, and you will not hear and obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you will certainly perish and you will not live long in the land which you cross the Jordan to enter and possess. Verse 19. I'll call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you. That I've set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, you shall choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. Verse 20. By loving the Lord, your God, by obeying his voice and by holding closely to him. What, what else do, do I have to say? Because it's talking about living and walking in the spirit here. For he is your life, your good life, your abundant life, your fulfilled and the length of your days, your fulfillment and the length of your days, your fulfillment and the length of your days that you may live in the land which the Lord promised or swore to give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Need I say more? In those verses, you see the fact that if I'm going, I, if, if, if God's going to be on the throne in my life, okay, I have to submit my routine and my agenda to him, put him on the throne first, then let everything fall around him. Mm. See, God's agenda for my life is the passport I need to fulfill me. God's agenda in my life is the passport I need for fulfillment. So I need to make a choice and make room for that choice. If Jesus is Lord of my life, then put him on the throne and keep him there. Simple as that. It should not be your car. It should not be your woman. It should not be your man. Hallelujah. It should not even be your kids. Hmm. Put God there first. Let him lay, let him lay out the priorities after that. And, you, and all those things that you think so important now, he will always protect for you. Because he knows you're depending on him. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. And let him direct your path. Amen. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 6. Now, I broke this verse down so he can put it on the screen, but I broke it down and I added the things that the words meant in the scripture to give you a better understanding of the scripture. It says, in all your ways, I just quoted it, but it says, in all your ways, ways according to the course or pattern you set for your life, acknowledge him, recognize his authority, and he shall direct make straight, uh, bring uh, pleasure and prosperity your way. Your paths or course of life would never be the same. That's awesome. And on the screen you got, in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Wow, that's rich. I'm gonna say it one more time because you gotta get this. In all your ways, according to the course or pattern you set for your life, acknowledge him. 
recognize his authority and he shall direct, make straight, uh, bring, bring pleasure and, prosper and, and, and prosperity uh, to your path or course of life. Hmm. Another reason why, and I'm, I'm just going on to the next point, you can find it difficult to live and walk in the spirit is this. Your plate is too full. So hearing the voice of God is impossible. Let alone walk and live in the spirit. Okay. <laughs> and let's face it. Have you ever heard or thought that before? You know, my plate too full. I got too much going on, you know. Yeah, I understand. I, 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 I you know, but, but, but. <laughs> See, my plate is too full because I'm kind of bogged down with the things. Having things forces my conscious out of perspective. The more things I got, the more my conscious is pushed away from the proper perspective. Matthew chapter six, verse 33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. So it's, it's vitally important that I don't let the things take me away from the focus of who should be on the throne in my life. I am walking and living in the spirit of God and nothing is going to take me out of that position. Hmm. Amen. Another thing is, and I'm going to have to end with this. One. Another thing is false doctrines that stimulate the flesh that develops doubt and unbelief aimed at the word of God. Now, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to close with this, but you're going to have to really listen close. Because see, most of y'all, see, I ain't going to say most of you. Some of you don't think you need a teacher. But how can they be taught without a pastor? Okay, so you can't just stay home. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. I'm talking about false doctrines. What I've heard or seen on YouTube, I turned, I, I looked through it one day and I saw this guy who had this whole lesson plan out where he's uh, uh, cursing what churches do when they tell people to come to church on Sunday and make them feel bad about, and, and make them feel bad if they don't go. That Saturday is really the Sabbath. Sunday was, a, was part of the Roman calendar and it was cursed. So you should not go to church on, the, on, on Sunday. And, it, it, you know, I, I, was, I was kind of fascinated with it because I couldn't believe somebody would get away with all that. I'm going to give you something today. Hallelujah. That I believe is going to help those of you who've heard that before to ask, ask, or qu ask questions or learn, not ask questions, but have answers for somebody that comes to you with that. And you feel like it's some way that is a way that you can, you can use that to keep from coming to church. Okay, because that's all the enemy. Now listen to this, verse 20, 28, Matthew chapter 26, it says, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Now, another word for the covenant is, the, is a testament, am I right? Now, that's just setting the foundation somewhat. What I want to do now is go to John chapter 4, 5 verse 17. Y'all write these down. John chapter 5 verse 17. Hallelujah. Praise God. It says, he'll catch up with me. There you go. But Jesus answered them. Listen to this. He said, Jesus said, everybody say Jesus said. See, this ain't pastor. But Jesus answered them. He said it. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. No, -uh, no 18, leave it there. But Jesus said to them, now Jesus said it, it's red letter edition. My father has been working until now, and I have been working. 
now in until now takes it's, it's taken back to two thought to two thousand years okay what Jesus was talking about was the two thousand years before okay <laughs> and that's back to the recorded biblical record Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 but he said my father has been working till now so it take Jesus is saying back then when creation when, when in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 up from then to now he's been working am I right from then till now he's been working hmm in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth now now I want you to go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Now this, this is going to mess with you. See, because a lot of people take this, this kind of stuff and, and, and build religions around it. I'm going to set the record straight. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all, that, all the host of them were what? Finished. Don't flick it until I tell you now. Okay, uh, 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 we're finished. Now the word finished means the work was done. Am I right? It just means the work was done. Next verse, two. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the Sabbath day from all his work, which he had done. But now, go back to John chapter 15, verse 7. <laughs> John chapter 15, verse 7, it says, Jesus must be lying. Jesus said but <laughs> to them, my father has been working. You see it? My father has been working. It's 517. My, uh, 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 my father has been working until now and I have been working but now in Genesis it says did God has finished his work hmm it says he finished his work on the seventh day and he finished all his work now there's a simple quick answer for this See, and some, you know, people are cursing people for going to church on every day but the Sabbath. That's not right. That's not right. <laughs> it's so simple. Oh, my God. Listen to this. Genesis talks about where he did that work. Genesis chapter 2, verse chapter 1 and verse chapter 2 and so forth. Genesis was the creation story. God finished that. Y'all getting it now? When it came to creation, it says God finished creation and he was, he sat down. He rested. But now, Adam sinned in the garden. <laughs> and when Adam sinned in the garden, uh, John chapter 5 verse 17 put it back up John chapter 5 verse 17 is talking about another project the creation project is over after the fall of man in the garden God had to go back to work well why did he have to go to back, back to work with the redemption plan because of Adam's fall or disobedience in the garden because he ate something that God told him not to eat. So he had finished the creation. Now it was redemption. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, my father, ha my father has been working on what? The redemption plan until now. And I, I have been working. Mm. <laughs> so now in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and so forth. Jesus, or God finished the creation story or the creation plan. When man fell in the garden and Adam disobeyed, uh, 
God had the redemption plan ready to bring man back into the state before Adam had sinned. Okay. So God has been working and I have been working, says the Lord. Wow. Now, so you got that clear. When it says that God rested during creation, it was because creation was over. He had done what he, supposed, what he was going to do. But then when Adam fell, he had a redemption plan that he had to go to work on to get man to back into a right relationship with God. So he didn't rest. He couldn't rest it. Who was dealing with man all that time from Genesis to when Jesus showed up? So he wasn't work. He was. He wasn't resting. And that's why Jesus wasn't lying when he said, my father has been working and I have been working until now. I'm here now. <laughs> oh, boy. First Corinthians chapter three, verse nine. So I'm giving you something, something that you can take with you. I'm giving you a little meat. OK. So now God has been working. Jesus has been working up till now. God and Jesus have been working. Now, verse nine, first Corinthians chapter three, verse nine, nine. Can't wait on you. I went over my time for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Wow. Jesus said God has been working. Jesus said that he has been working. Now he says that we are fellow workers with him. <laughs> that we are God's field. And what do you do with a field? You, you, you plow seed, okay, and harvest a field. Then he goes on to say that we are God's building. Now, God has been working on a building and you're that building. You're that building. Hmm. So now, isn't it amazing? We are workers, but also the object of the work. We are God's fellow workers. We're his field. Oh my God, we're his building. That's what Paul told us under the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Who? Jesus said, and I'm just capping, recapping. Jesus said, God has been working. Jesus said that he's been working. Got it? Genesis tells us that God had quit working. He quit working on the, and I'm saying this because I know somebody's not getting it. He quit working on the creation project. It was gone. It was done. The next project was getting man back into the relationship they had lost with him because of Adam's sin. So all through the world, you see this redemption plan working out. And God says, okay, all this time, and I like this part all this time. Okay. I've, I've made you my fellow workers, but you're my field where I'm planting my seed. Oh my God. And harvesting my seed in you. You got it. I'm doing all that in you, but you're also my building. I'm building you up. So not again, not only are, are we workers, but we're also the object of his work. Okay. Amen. <laughs> now, <clears throat> so then, oh my God. Oh, mm. go quickly to Mark 2, 27 and 28. This is the last verse. I'm about three minutes over. Three, four minutes old. Mark chapter 2, verse 27 through 28. This 
you got to hear. It says, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Wait a minute, the Sabbath was made, for, this is Jesus talking, he says, uh, in fact, go to, uh, is that 27? Okay. I'm going to read some, I'm going to read the verse before this. It says, now it happened that when he went through the grain fields, this is Jesus, on the Sabbath, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. They're working. And the Pharisees said to him, look, why do they do what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Hmm. He said, but he said to them, well, this is what Jesus answered. He said, have you ever read that David, what, they, what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him, how he went into the house of the Lord or the house of God in the days of Abitar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which was not lawful to eat except for the priest. He ate, they went in there and ate all the priest's bre priest bread and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Wow. Therefore, the son of man is also Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I am also the Lord of the Sabbath. I like what the Message Bible said about that last verse. It says, then Jesus said, the Sabbath was made to serve us. We weren't made to serve the Sabbath. The son of man is, is, is no yes man to the Sabbath. He is in charge of the Sabbath. Ooh. Mm. The Amplified says Jesus has authority over the Sabbath. <laughs> the Sabbath was made for the benefit of man and not man to benefit the Sabbath. And I, the Messiah, have authority even to decide what men can do on the Sabbath days. So what am I saying? The, 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 the discussion was that one reason why we have a problem walking in the spirit and living in the spirit was because of false doctrines that stimulate the flesh that develops doubt and unbelief aimed at the word of God. I just proved to you in scripture that God has no problem with you going to church any day of the week. You know why? Because he's not just Lord of the Sabbath, He's Lord on Sunday. He's Lord on Monday. He's Lord on Tuesday. He's Lord on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. You mean to tell me the, 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 the Savior who created all has to yield a day because somebody put another label on it? It doesn't make sense. Halloween is not Halloween. We don't celebrate Halloween. We celebrate hallelujah. Because God is the God of Halloween. Do you see that? Hmm. So I serve a God that's over every day. Hallelujah. So if we choose to come to church on Sunday, I don't care what the Roman Catholic Church did, I come on Sunday to glorify him. And God has no problem with it. Jesus has no problem with it. He said, because you know what? I didn't follow that rule either. <laughs> and you, you, you know what your focus should be on the Sabbath or Sunday or any other day? Me. That's what he's saying. Oh, that was good. Praise God. Give God a, give God a praise over that. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, if you're here today, oh yeah, I'm about five minutes old. If you're here today, and you do not know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, we did not leave this, this broadcast without extending that invitation to you. I know I was a little bit, I, I was so excited today. I had some mixed feelings, as, you know, but uh, uh, Jesus is Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, if you do not know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, I'm going to say a prayer now. After I'm done with that prayer, if you can believe it, you can receive it, and you're in the family of God. 
every head bowed, every eye closed. Those of, you, those of you who want Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, raise your hands to the Lord and let's pray. Hallelujah. Say, Father, in the precious name of Jesus, I thank you for giving me your son who died and rose again the third day for me. I receive Jesus now as my personal Lord and Savior. And I give you praise, Lord, that now I am in the family of God. And so, Father, I thank and praise you also for the baptism with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Now I'm I am empowered to serve you. So now I proclaim to the world, I'm saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, I have my prayer language and I'm ready to serve you in Jesus name. Now, if you said that prayer, you are now in the family of God. Let's give God a praise for that. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, if you receive salvation, what we'd like you to do is give us your name and some information where we can get in touch with you because we want to welcome you to the family of God. Hallelujah. Then we have some information we'd like to give you that simply explains the confession you made here today. Hallelujah. Then if you'd like to become a member of New Covenant Christian Center, we're a church that builds, builds people of principle, prayer, power, praise, and purpose. When you come to New Covenant, you find family, faith, forgiveness, and fulfillment. We're not a perfect church. There is none, but we are striving for perfection in the things of God. So if you'd like to become a member of New Covenant Christian Center, we're 35 to 40 people have since COVID started here over the airways or, or the computer ways or whatever, but they become members. If you'd like to become a member, just shoot us your information. Hallelujah. You need text NCCC to 71441 and everything is kept in the strictest of confidence and we will get in touch with you and give you the information necessary so you can be connected with the vision that you have, 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 have brought yourself under. Praise God. And we're giving God all the praise for you having done that. You're in a church that loves like none other that is catching the fire for 2022. Two. Amen. And so t the rest of 2021 and 2022. And if you have a, uh, if you need prayer, hallelujah, we'd like you to do the same thing. We'd like you to give us your name, your address, and, and get, leave us the information we need so we can get back in touch with you because you, what you need in prayer is, is, is serious for us too. What you want us to agree, agree with you in prayer for is serious to us too. Well, our heart goes out to you and we'd like to get in touch with you so we can pray with you keep, you, keep you on the cutting edge of what God is preparing for your life. So now, if you just need prayer, text NCCC to 71441 and then uh, leave us your information. We'll pray with you. We'll minister to you. We will disciple you and help you get through that thing to where you come out on the other side in the glory of God with all your needs met, every desire fulfilled. Well, we thank God for you being with us tonight. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. And uh, <laughs> thank God for Jesus. We walk by faith, not by sight, no matter what. This is your year and the, the rest of your life is a life full of jubilee. God bless you. Have a great and blessed evening.